Hi, everybody. Thank you. So uh, we are so lucky to have uh, Chelsea here um, so we can ask her everything um, and uh, also just admire her talent. So thank you so much for thank you. telling us this uh, wonderful story. Uh, so I'm uh, Mirna Malgar. I'm the immediate past president of the City Planning Commission. And as everybody knows, San Francisco is also going through a building boom. Uh, so we thought it would be interesting to uh, talk about um, what's going on in our country um, and what's going on uh, in Texas and how it relates to um, San Francisco and really to Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, and what's going on uh, in the global workforce. So um, before that, I wanted to introduce my uh, fellow panelists. So, um, if, if I'm sorry, I'm trying to. So uh, maybe I'll just let you <laughs> introduce yourself. So uh, Chelsea Hernandez is our filmmaker. Um, she has been nominated eight times. Is that what I read in your bio to an Emmy? Um, They're like the Texas Emmys. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, here we go. So she received a bachelor's from the University of Texas. She is um, the first in her Latino family to um, go to college. Um, she has directed and produced various documentary films, uh, including See the Dirt, An Uncertain Future. Um, and Chelsea is an NALIP Latino Media Market Fellow. Firelight Media Doc Lab Fellow, Tribeca Story Lab Fellow, Tribeca All Access Recipient, and Bayback National Media Maker Fellow. Her newest project is about the student loan crisis. Way to go, Chelsea. Thank you. Um, and then uh, we are also very um, lucky to be joined by my friend Cynthia Gomez. Uh, so Cynthia is a senior research analyst for Unite Here Local 2. Here is um, Hotel Employees and Restaurant Employees Union, the Union of Hospitality Workers. She taught elementary school for five years before moving to the field of union research. She has lived in the Bay Area for more than 35 years and curs currently lives in the East Bay where she writes scary stories in her spare time. I did not know that about you, <laughs> Cynthia. That's great. So uh, maybe we can start, um, Chelsea. Uh, you know what, what struck me about this film the the what you, the stories you're telling are you know global. They have to do with the economics of building and who pays the price. But you did such a great job in um, humanizing these stories. How did you pick um, the folks that you wanted to to feature? Sure. Um, thank, I, I also wanted to thank um, SF Urban um, Film Festival for. Um, screening this film and bringing it here to you all tonight. Thank you so much, Susie and, and Faye. Um, so I started working on this film in 2014. Um, the idea came to me in 2009 while I was attending University of Texas. There was a scaffold collapse um, of three workers who fell to their death um, while building a student luxury condominium on campus. Um, and that was kind of the catalyst to me um, going out and researching and finding out that Texas was the deadliest state for construction and that nearly half the million person workforce were undocumented. Um, so as each new building was going up in my hometown, I just kept seeing like numbers of you know fatalities or, or injuries um, and recognized that this wasn't being told in a, um, a bigger platform. Um, and so I met, uh, I had some friends of mine um, who were volunteering at the Workers' Defense Project, and that was how um, I found out what they were doing, um, started meeting some construction workers. Um, Christian Hurtado was the first person that I met. Um, um, DACA was sort of happening at the time as well, and so I thought the whole story was going to be around DACA and DAPA um, at that time, but... Um, um, I realized that was a whole nother story. Um, but as I was filming with him, um, Workers Defense Project was working on passing a rest break ordinance. And they had tried a year prior and had failed. Um, and so then they started the fight again. And so I, I was um, filming and that was when I met the Granillo family, unfortunately. Um, 
Um, and so their family, I mean, they had just lost uh, Roindi like maybe two months before I met them. And I met um, Gustavo at, at a rally in front of City Hall. And um, they were just using their emotion and their traumatic experience in this fight, um, I think, to kind of help them as well. Um, so we started following them, and through that, I, I also met Claudia um, Golanelli, and I was also just enamored by her with her lipstick on and her earrings, like standing up and fighting. And um, she definitely reminded me of like my mother and and how she sort of like wore the pants in the family <laughs> and taking care of things. Um, so. Um, at that time too, she was in the middle of dealing with her wage theft claim. Um, and then um, shortly thereafter, she had um, a run in with an officer and had to um, check in with ICE regularly. So um, she, they all just really trusted me. We had a lot of conversations and I'm really thankful that they allowed, um, uh, they opened the door for me to be able to film um, some pretty, you know, emotional things that they were going through in life. Yeah, so I, it really struck me. It was so wonderful to um, be exploring these themes, and you captured so well sort of the love story, you know, and how she noticed, you know, the, that this man that she fell in love with was so different, you know, in terms of gender roles. So, um, and But that's really interesting that you uh, say that they started the campaign a year before that, and it strikes me uh, something that uh, Cynthia was saying before the film uh, when we were chatting that, um, you know, it took a death, you know, f in this family for the folks in the city council to actually consider to even bring it to a vote. So I'm wondering, Cynthia, you know, in your, your experience with workers, is it, is it, is that what happens? Is it some, when something like, happens, like shit hits the fan, that we finally can make progress on basic human rights uh, for workers. Um, so, you know what's interesting is that we're sitting here in the Redstone building and um, before, more than 20 years ago now actually, before I ever came to the labor movement, uh, I used to do volunteer work dealing, helping to organize families who had lost a loved one to police brutality. Um, and it's a very similar story where um, the, the wish for someone who has experienced the worst loss imaginable, the death of a child, just, it goes against everything that is natural to us as human beings, is we love our children. I don't have any children personally, but I know what it's like to love a young person. And we, we love our children very much, and we put all of our love and care into them with the idea that they're going to carry on. And it goes against everything natural to lose a child. And so in that extreme pain, one of the things that's, that is a commonality between people who've lost a loved one as in the situation uh, that Chelsea's film talks about, or when people lose a loved one to police brutality, there's this, this urge to not have someone's death be in vain, as we hear in the film. The idea that if I had to suffer this terrible thing, at the very least, I can hope to harness those emotions towards something positive. So it's just, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting roundness that we're sitting here talking about a situation that's in many ways different, but in, in my mind, the commonality, frankly, in terms of black and brown bodies, it's not exclusively black and brown bodies, but it is overwhelmingly black and brown bodies that are not valued, to put it far too mildly, that are considered disposable. And so I know I'm not answering your question specifically as it applies to hotel workers. Um, you know, one of the things that is, more acute, yeah, I, I could spend a lot of time talking about what hotel workers have to deal with. Um, it is not often as acute as a death, um, although, you know, there, there certainly has been a lot of violence perpetrated against women who work in the hospitality industry. But again, the theme is again and again that the engine that is driving all this economic growth, all this, pros all this progress, what I would say is that the engine that drives all that is economic inequality, that it's actually built in and baked in. And so you have bodies that are considered expendable, black and brown bodies, immigrant bodies, female bodies. And so it is that kind of experience that you see in the hospitality industry. It's overwhelmingly female bodies that are considered um, 
unfortunately, the property of to all too often men. It's one of the highest industries for sexual harassment um, and for sexual violence against women. And it's a tremendous battle to try to address some of those things in not just our work, but collectively through movement work. Um, so, you know, one of the things that is going on um, really all over the country, but now in Austin, Dallas, and certainly in San Francisco, is, um, you know, an acute housing shortage. Um, and, you know, the um, call um, has been, you know, build, build, build. It's, if it's, um, it's a market-driven uh, proposition that it, it's, you know, shortage of housing, so therefore we must deregulate as much as we can and build as much as we can, as fast as we can to, um, you know, Think, and things will get better. And, you know, we uh, saw that in the discussion with the city council um, when they were talking about a freaking 10-minute break every four hours, um, how um, if we say no to business or if we in any way regulate, um, that it will bring everything to a standstill and what we're trying to do will stop. And so I'm wondering um, what the discussion has been um, around uh, Dallas and in Austin, in terms of just even challenging the narrative of, you know, um, that that deregulating everything is what we have to do, um, and that uh, you know the human cost is really, you know, an externality that we don't even care about because the greater good um, is more important. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we've seen it. Um, um, over and over again with um, the conservative base that um, business is more important than people um, putting profits over people. Um, and so this was, um, I think for me that scene was really important because it was showing that um, this is happening on a local level. Um, like even the mayor had voted against the rest break ordinance as well. Um, and it's, it's not like, um, they're going to be losing money for a 10 minute rest break. Um, um, but um, what we've been seeing now is um, um, so Texas passed one of the um, worst anti immigration laws um, in the country about, um, I guess, I think it was 2017, um, SB4, which was the show me your papers law. So um, if you got pulled over, um, the officer can um, have the right to ask you for your immigration status. Um, and then just in seeing the anti-immigrant policies that Trump administration has passed, um, you know, it has caused um, a lot of people to um, flee, at least in Texas. And what we're seeing now is actually like a, sh a shortage of workers. Um, even at the time that I was filming this, um, when Hurricane Harvey had hit in Houston, there was, um, before it had hit, there was a 20,000 worker shortage just in Houston alone. Um, and so I think people were wondering like, who, who was gonna build, you know, rebuild Houston and, and continue to help um, the economy. But then there's still this juxtaposition from a lot of these conservatives of, you know, um, passing these anti-immigrant bills. Um, um, and yet, like, they, they depend on them for the, their industry, you know? So um, they're, you know, still not willing to pay fair wages or um, to protect workers. And so, I, I don't know, I think we'll see what happens in a few years um, within the, the building industry, you know? How, see if it will collapse at all. And, you know, we've seen this uh, a lot. It's not just in building. It's also been um, in scaling back community benefits and the, you know, rights of workers to unionize. Um, and, you know, what, um, where do you see this going here in the local level, Cynthia? Um, I mean, there's definitely been calls for um, deregulating um, the, the, or shortening the amount of time that it takes for buildings to get built and cut back on the process of community benefits? I mean, I have my local two hat and then I have my curious about all things in the world hat and so it's kind of difficult to figure out which of them I get to put on and take off at any given second. But, you know, definitely if what we're talking about is the idea, I mean, it, it, when, when Chelsea was, was talking about this, um, 
this this boom and bust cycle, if you will. I mean, it's not a external boom and bust cycle, but it's a natural reaction to people feeling that they don't have as many rights and are not considered as important or as valuable, and then they're going to flee, and then shockingly, you know, people don't uh, find as many construction workers to build their buildings. Um, and so, you know, you I think you maybe see some of that in the Bay Area, but, you know, we were talking earlier, you were talking about, uh, just before the film started, about the role of unions, and I think, you know, without sounding like a commercial for the role of unions, it's actually one of the only differences that you're, uh, it's one of the most powerful differences. I mean, when I was watching the, the, the film, one of the themes that struck me, because it's the second time I've seen it, is just how much effort and work, I'm sure, behind the scenes went into the Workers' Defense Project, and just how much effort is expended on helping people have a place and a voice and organizing them. It's one of the roles union plays. Something like the Workers' Defense Project plays a very similar role. And that is really the going to be the difference um, between people having a voice and people not having a voice. And it's one of the reasons why Texas is such an anti-union state, right? And it's one of the reasons why you hear this right to work state, right to work state coming from the mouth of some of these council people is because they know perfectly well that that's actually one of the differences. And it's why what you see on a national level is an attack on any vehicle where workers may organize themselves and or each other to stand up for themselves. And so, you know, taking it back to the theme that you're asking about local development and this push to build, 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 streamline, streamline, streamline. Um, it's not just, it certainly is the right of people to unionize that can get lost in that conversation. Um, but, you know, thinking of the theme of um, Randy's father, Gustavo is Randy's father? Uh, as he's doing this tremendously detailed, skilled work to build this house, and he's thinking about, um, well, who, who might, when you're sitting down in, at your house, who might have built that house? And I think that um, it's not an accident that those voices are going to get lost and that the most vulnerable voices are the first to get silenced and to get shoved aside. Um, there's plenty more to be said. I, I think that fundamentally the idea of just build, build, build is not actually driven by what human beings need at all, and that the movement to build, build, build is not driven or funded by people whose mission is to see human to meet human need first. I think it's driven by profit. I think we've all seen what happens when when profit is the driver, but you know that's uh, its own panel and its own right, and so I'll kind of leave it for that. Thank you. And just one last question to to Chelsea, because um, you know the. Um, you go in the film into the issues of immigration um, and uh, you know why folks uh, would come. Um, and in the stories that you told, folks learned the skills that they brought with them elsewhere. So uh, the iron worker, it was their grandparents who started the business. Um, for Claudia, you know, she learned electricity in El Salvador. So these are folks who come to this country knowing stuff that this country needs. And, you know, the, the uh, CEO of the construction company, what was, it, what was the name? Stan Mary. So, Merrick? Merrick. Yeah. Merrick, yeah. So he uh, acknowledges that they desperately need workers, right? Um, and so, you know, the irony, right, that in this moment it's really fueled by racism that something that we desperately need we are cracking down on. Um, but, you know, where do you see this going? I mean, you know, our, our housing shortage, we, you know, the, the economy right now is supposedly booming. That's what our... our president says. <laughs> um, so we, you know, it's b fueling the construction industry. We need more workers and at the same time we're cracking down during a time where people are fleeing countries because of, you know, the climate crisis, because of violence. Um, so it seems like, you know, the, the two extremes are going to get even more acute. Um, and so in right to work states like Texas or friendlier states like California, there's still going to be this, this um, conflict. Where, where do you see this going? Yeah, um, so I think at least in Texas, um, at least in my hometown in Austin, what I've noticed is um, the, um, 
a it's it's become very visible. Uh, the economic gap has become very visible um, among families. A lot of these construction workers who are building these high rises downtown can will probably never be able to afford living in in one of those places, um, which is why I wanted to put that kind of extreme example of that three and a half million dollar loft um, at the beginning. Um, um, because people like Gustavo and Claudia and even Christian, Christian helped supervise the Google um, high rise that was built um, downtown. Um, he was a safety inspector there. Um, but he lives, you know, um, maybe about 30 minutes north of Austin. A lot of people live um, outside and, um, and they're, they're just trying to get by, you know. Um, so as much as like there's um, a need for housing, um, there's also um, housing inequality um, and definitely income inequalities among a lot of um, um, brown um, people in, in the community. Um, and it's, it's causing, um, you know, a lot of stress um, emotionally, um, I think for the Granillo family, um, you know, they have to deal with losing a son who was kind of the breadwinner, um, for their family. Gustavo works, but he, um, has a really bad knee. He's getting older. Um, he can't do as much, um, as his son did. Um, he, um, doesn't get to spend a lot of time with his daughters. Um, so it, um, that kind of like depression and anxiety of like, are we gonna have food on our table gets passed down, um, towards, um, the next generation. So, um, yeah, I, I think we're we're like seeing more of that within our community, um, unfortunately. And then um, it's it's really like you know when when is the construction when is that bus gonna sort of happen because this boom just keeps going and these council members are continuing to support these businesses coming in. But there's also a reason why they're like half the workforce is undocumented because it's really hard work. Um, and and the wages aren't going up as well, you know? Um, and I think that's why you see Stan Merrick, who's a very complex person. We could have gone way longer with him in the film, but he was um, a little convoluted in a sense that like, He's, um, he's for immigration reform, he is this Republican, he voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016 um, because he didn't want to deport 11 million people because he needs them for his business, you know? Um, but there's still something there, you know, I think you had mentioned just kind of like this um, continuous racism within the industry as well and that still exists. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know, we'll, we'll see what, what happens within the industry in a few years. Um, so one last question for Cynthia, uh, because it occurs to me, you know, in seeing that um, in the future, right, the worsening income inequality, this is not the first time in our country we've been at that moment. Um, and, you know, where is organized labor in this? You know, um, I so I worked um, as a researcher for the Carpenters Union, as you know, years ago, and we did a study um, in in the East Coast in Connecticut, where I worked. Uh, and the average age in our local um, was uh, 58, um, and you know, folks lived in the suburb, but the folks who were doing the work were younger. They were Latino, increasingly, lots of women, um, and there was a, a little bit of a reluctance there. And so I'm wondering where, when, when are we? going to do this shift? I mean, the worker center is filling in, you know, uh, to help people. Um, but when do we, we take that step as an organized labor movement to address these inequalities? That's another topic for three or four panels. But, you know, I think, so our union is a pretty good microcosm of some of what you're talking about. We, you know, there, you'll look around and you'll see among people who are who work uh, on staff at the union. You'll you'll see younger folks and you'll see older folks, and you will see a lot of the younger folks driving a lot of the really difficult conversations, just as happened a generation ago. So, 40 plus years ago, our union's staff would have looked very different. You wouldn't have seen materials in Spanish, even though a huge proportion of our workforce was. Spanish speaking, and it was the younger people who came up and pushed and struggled very hard within not just our union, but within the labor movement, that those were the shifts that you were seeing. And I agree with you that it's very piecemeal in terms of the broader labor movement. But 
if your question is about, okay, what does the labor movement have to say about income inequality? I feel like it's, it's a conversation that needs to happen broadly among all, all the different, the, the wide spectrum of labor. Because for, for one thing, I think it's not quite accurate to, to and I don't think that you would uh, disagree with this, to talk about labor as a monolith. It's not, right? Um, labor has very different relationships to capital. Different labor unions have different relationships to capital, and that's going to inform their politics. Our union in particular has taken on um, economic inequality as a major cornerstone of our fight. We had a tremendous nationwide strike in 2018. There were eight different cities that all went on strike at the same time, and that was deliberate because the idea was to collectivize our strength. And the slogan of that was, one job should be enough. That's the kind of slogan that I don't think you would have needed when I was born because that was a different time for US capital. That was a time when it was theoretically possible for a working class person to own a home with one job. They may or may not have had a college education, but they were able to have a sort of steady middle class lifestyle. The problem was that, you know, when I was born in the late 70s, that was almost exclusively to white working class men. And so that's the moment that we are responding to uh, as, as labor, and in particular where Local 2 comes into that, is our, our workforce is overwhelmingly immigrant. Um, our leadership has a lot of women in it, and we are fighting very hard to make it that um, just because the work itself is often done by people who get shoved aside and shoved out of the body politic, the human beings deserve respect. The human beings who do this work deserve to have the kind of lifestyle that um, was for so long considered the province of the working class white male without a college education. And without getting too much onto the soapbox of the political moment we're in, I think that is what's driving the crisis behind um, why so many people in this country are driven to support Donald Trump because there used to be an explicit promise that if you were a white working class man, there was a lifestyle that you were guaranteed to have for the most part. It wasn't without struggle, certainly, but there has been such a body of research and work that is examining what's happened to that economic stability and the tremendous amount of white supremacy that has come and surged to the fore when there's, when all of a sudden that promise, which was always founded on racism, and was always founded on sexism, when cracks began to emerge in that promise. Um, there's a book called Dying of Whiteness, which kind of encapsulates it in the title. And I realize I kind of went a, a little bit off tangent, but I think there's no way to talk about the moment that we're in with labor without talking about these cracks that are emerging and what they reveal about the foundations of white supremacy that this country has always been founded on. Thank you. Um, so I uh, want to say thank you so much, uh, Chelsea. I look forward to uh, seeing more of your work. You are so amazingly talented. And uh, Cynthia, also, <laughs> you are so amazingly talented and look forward to seeing your work. Um, and I want to say, uh, say thank you so much to the folks at the San Francisco Urban Film Festival for allowing the space for this discussion to take place, for bringing Chelsea and, um, you know, showing this amazing film for Susie and Faye and Robin and all the folks who uh, put in their time and energy to bring us all together. And thank you all for coming. Can I, we wanted to open up just a little bit for audience questions, if that is okay with you guys. Just a few minutes. Does anyone in the audience have questions? Okay. First, thank you so much for that film um, and for having this panel. I'm curious about the OSHA regulations and how, like, like, what are the federal regulations? And because people should be able to take breaks. 
Um, so there is no federal law mandating um, construction companies give their workers a rest break. It's um, uh, suggested. Um, and so um, there's a lot of uh, information um, in English and Spanish of all these ways that you should get rest and shade and water, um, but it's not like written into law that like you need to provide um, at least 10 minutes every four hours or um, something similar in that regard. Oh, I think she's been Thank you for the beautiful film. I loved where it went, and it was as gorgeous and more than I remember it. So it, really, really beautiful. Um, first, I wanted to apologize for my ignorance because I don't know the situation for construction workers and mandated work breaks here in California, but I know I see a lot of construction going on. Is there anything, since there's nothing federal, is there anything happening in the state, and are there high incidents of fatalities under similar situations with construction workers here? I think we're all looking at each other because we realize that there there are still some gaps. Um, I'm, I uh, suppose I would be the most um, natural person to answer that question, but there's a lot I don't know either. So the short answer is I actually have no idea. As far as construction workers go, uh, as the situation for construction workers goes, I am not aware one way or the other of what uh, of what OSHA says. Well, we have Cal OSHA in mm -hmm. uh, California, which is uh, much. A stronger regulatory body than the federal OSHA. Um, and, you know, in San Francisco, uh, we have, um, you know, for high rises, big construction, hotels, um, you know, most of that is unionized. Um, and most of the residential sort of lower density uh, construction is not. Um, and so there is a big disparity in um, sort of accidents uh, between, you know, unionized labor force and, and the force that's not unionized. Hi, thank you for um, your attention to these important issues, um, especially thank you for this film and coming out here to speak about it. I was wondering if you could speak more about the local political environment in um, the cities that you focused on and if it's, um, if they tend to lean conservative or if there is possibility for um, more progressive activity as we see the tides of, um, you know, the te Texas demographics changing and, um, yeah, political shifts over time. Um, the urban areas are blue. Um, <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, and um, sh uh, in Dallas, um, the mayors have uh, term limits. Um, so that mayor is now gone. Um, and I believe they um, elected, well, they don't go by party lines, I guess, in the local um, city councils, but the person who's now mayor in um, in Dallas, um, I believe, is, is a Democrat. Um, and... Um, um, the Callahan, the first guy we saw talking, um, he's no longer in office. Um, I think he got voted out. And then the other guy, Kleinman, was very, very close to getting kicked out. I think that was like a 1% difference. Um, so I think there is a change in um, at least the major cities. Um, but um, kind of what you were saying earlier too, um, in California, the same goes in Texas, is we do see a lot of injuries and accidents happening among um, residential construction. So um, the big high rises, they do have a lot of supervisors involved. And so um, I think there's more enforcement in that end. Although Though there was um, in New Orleans um, this past summer, or um, not this past summer, um, in October, um, a collapse of the Hard Rock Hotel and um, restaurant, like right off Canal Street, um, which we screened the film um, a few days after that happened. And the Granillo family um, was there with us and Claudia, and um, one of the cranes was like imploded during the um, screening of the film. It was a very surreal moment. Um, 
But um, as far as like in the residential areas, we just see a, um, a lack of enforcement, um, really. And I think, you know, Christian and the Workers Defense Project have tried really hard to create this program called Better Builder, um, which um, they've kind of set up as a national model. So, you know, who knows where it will go um, nationally, but they work with developers um, to um, adopt a set of standards, like you have to pay your workers a living wage. Um, we provide a inspector, you can't go and get your own, um, that you provide rest breaks, um, and um, uh, they all have to get like, I think 10 or 15 hours of OSHA training. Um, and and then uh, Workers Defense Project is kind of that um, liaison. If anybody has complaints or something, they can safely um, complain um, about any sort of um, dangers um, within their construction site. So, um, so I think like as you go out of the urban areas, it gets, um, a little less progressive, and I think there's still a lot more work um, that has to be done in those areas. Um, but a lot of the boom is happening, you know, in in the urban um, cities and and surrounding the the major cities as well. <laughs>